Thank you for inviting me. I have been, Gabrielle and I have been exchanging emails I think for two years, so I really appreciate your persistence and I, I'm delighted to be here. So, When Gabrielle and I were exchanging topics, uh, we thought we would, we settled on American fowl brood because this seemed to be a topic that, first of all, uh, with the veterinary feed directive in place, it was something, I mean, we're seeing American fowl brood outbreaks um, across the, in fact, Pennsylvania is just, is, is you know, they, they had an outbreak uh, two weeks ago. Uh, while we were in Montreal. So it just seemed like it was a, a topic that was um, at the moment in front of us. So, um, but having said that, uh, some of you remember me before I was an apiarist and some of you were, you know, so there's some, some background that you may have some questions about and feel free uh, after this talk, uh, we, if you have some, some questions about the work I did on surface mine sites, I'm happy to talk about that um, and uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, have a good time together. Um, I always like to remind people that as a beekeeper, you should always have an American fowl brood test kit, a diagnostic kit. Uh, they have one available for both uh, European fowl brood and American fowl brood. And I probably, I find this to be so important that I will probably use a picture of this later in the presentation, but I like to start with that. That if, because for many beekeepers, they haven't seen uh, American fowl brood. And so it really is helpful if you've got some of these symptoms that you're seeing, you know, there's a strange odor, you're seeing sunken cabins, you know, this can help you make a difficult decision very quickly. And they're not that expensive. They're only, you know, in Kentucky, I think they're like $14, $15. And because Kentucky has 54 different beekeeping associations, I advise each beekeeping association to have uh, several of these on hand so that the beekeepers can go and pick them up if they need to. Uh, one of the things that I really admire about Florida is that you do have, you know, you may not hear from your, uh, your state officials in a timely manner, but you do have 13 apiarists. I am the only apiarist for 120 counties, and we do not require inspections. And so I, I, in one year, I had some extra money in my budget, and I bought several of these for every single beekeeping association just so that they're out there. However, having said that, they do have expiration dates. So if you do purchase one, make sure that you check that expiration date um, before you walk out the door um, because you do want to make sure that it's current. And um, so having said that. They sell them at Manly. They sell them. A lot of different bee, uh, a lot of different bee supply companies will sell them, and 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 I'm surprised at how how many times people will get into beekeeping and they don't even know that these exist. Uh, so I really do like to, like I said, start this talk out by, you know, this should be, you know, you should have one for each in your toolkit because bees get sick, and, you know, that's you know, the, it's biology. Um, this particular slide. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit in time. The, I, I tell people, these are my monkeys. I have 120 counties. Th this is my territory. But from 2008 until 2014, I worked with surface mine companies in eastern Kentucky to get pollinator habitat established and apiaries on those sites. And so what you're seeing here, I was born here. And I had, at the time I became the state apiarist in 2014, we had seven different apiaries. And my reason behind these apiaries, uh, this was the yard that I did my queen production in. And what you see behind here are some of the wildflowers that we planted for, for the fall. That's goldenrod going off. Um, the coal company wanted to protect the genetics that I had, so they built this fence. It didn't deter thieves. I had hives stolen every single year. Um, but this, this was my genetics yard. The second, uh, you know, so there's, there's queen rearing shop working workshop going off. And it's also my teaching yard. 
you know. We would bring groups of kids up to this, uh, in all of the yards, all seven of the yards, because we were trying to get uh, the sciences of beekeeping established in the local schools, uh, trying to show them some other uh, opportunities, career opportunities, knowledge-based careers, uh, in addition to um, the other kinds of careers that they were looking at. <clears throat> So for six years, this was my heartbeat. I mean, every day, you know, I was working on this, making this project work. And it all came to a crashing halt shortly after I think I've, I was here as part of the college in 2014. I went home from that conference, and I think three weeks later, there was an American foul brood outbreak. Well, all of a sudden, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> In addition, you know, having built these things up, you know, I have this major, I have this major epidemic on our hands, you know. So all of a sudden, as a state APRs, I'm having, I'm having to burn colonies. So thank you. So American fowl brood, these are some of the basics. I wanted to start with those pictures because a lot of times when I sit in talks about American fowl brood, they immediately jump me into the bacteria. You know, and, and that's a, obviously that's, a, that's the best place to begin. Um, American fowl brood has two stages, if you don't know this. Uh, it has a bacterial stage, and if you don't catch it, say you go on vacation for two to three weeks, you know, it can move into a spore stage. And, and it's difficult compared to other diseases because a lot of the damage is happening underneath a wax capping. And for people, you know, maybe of a certain generation who used to see American fowl brood before antibiotics became a kind of go-to control for this, you know, what older beekeepers will look for are sunken cappings. Uh, that, becomes, that becomes a telltale way. Another way, of course, is the smell. Um, it's called foul brood for a reason. Both American and European foul brood will have a smell to them. But I don't like to kind of hang my hat on that because every single one of us has different olfactory senses. So I can, I'm legally blind, my sense of smell compensates for my sight, I can walk out into the deck and I can immediately tell when things are blooming, right? But my husband has smoked for 30 years and he could, he, a skunk could spray him and he will not pick it up, you know? I mean, like he's like coming over for a kiss and I'm like, mm. <laughs> We'll find another one. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's right. We're still in our honeymoon stage. <laughs> but so, so the point here is that sometimes people won't smell uh, that. And especially if the disease has moved into the spore stage. To me, there's, a, there's an edge that's been taken off of that scent. So really, you want to look at other symptoms, too. You want to look for those sunken cappings. And I do have pictures of those. Um, you know, the, and, and the worker bees know that something is going on, so they will puncture cells, too. So if you see a lot of punctured cells, that's also a sign. Um, and it may be worth throwing out here, uh, Dr. Steve Purnell, he's a Canadian researcher, uh, he's done a lot of work with American fowl brood. And, and there are four different strains of this disease. There are two that are really contagious, and there are two that are less contagious. The problem is, of course, you as the beekeeper, you, d you have no way of, of, dis of distinguishing that. So. You know, we're, we're left to just kind of reading the frame, if you will. So I talked about those perforated cappings, and that's, that's an example of one of them. Sunken cappings is, the big, is one of the easiest ones to see. Uh, because what's happening is the reason why that capping is sunken is that the larva is disin disintegrating. It's becoming liquid underneath that capping, and it's pulling that capping inside. Right? So, <clears throat> very reliable test. And by now, if you're seeing this, you should be putting on gloves. 
Okay, you should be <laughs> you should be uh, thinking, uh oh, I could be dealing with a contagious disease here, right? And I carry in the state vehicle like a little package of, of toothpicks specifically for this reason. You know, you take a toothpick, some beekeepers will take a, a piece of straw, you know, something that will work and that they can puncture that capping. And if you see this rope, you almost, you don't need that diagnostic kit in some ways. I mean, that rope, there's no other disease that will cause this. You know that this hive has American fowl brood and that at this point in time, there's no control. Now, I will talk about uh, something called phages here later in the presentation. Uh, there's been some issues there, but, but there's some, there are some controls on the horizon is what I'm wanting to say, just so that you don't think I'm all gloom and doom. Uh, you may want to get another speaker if I just go down that train. But this is, um, this is your classic test. You know, and it doesn't rely on, uh, it's reliable. It's, you don't have to worry about smell and things like that. If you see this, this hive has American fowl brood. And, you know, in Kentucky anyway, uh, we advise beekeepers to burn and uh, burn as quickly as possible because the longer that that hive is, um, you know, diminishing in health, you know, other, other healthy hives are going to be trying to rob it out. And that's how, that is one way that American fowl brood will spread. Uh huh. They will, they will definitely. No, I say, if they go to this hive, they, it's like a immunization, you know? No, it doesn't. There's no immunization with American fowl brood. There had been in the 50s, uh, Dr. Walter Rothenbuehler at Ohio State University was doing work to try to get um, genetic resistance. Uh, but teramycin was developed, an antibiotic was developed, and uh, actually several different antibiotics were developed. And as soon as those antibiotics were developed, they were affordable, they were easy to use, uh, the commercial industry kind of latched onto them, and we've been on that antibiotic treadmill for a while. So that's been a, a major issue. Yes, sir? Um, since you brought up antibiotics, um, is that something that mostly commercial beekeepers do? It's just free, like, treat prophylactically? I don't want to throw the commercial bee industry under the bus. I mean, a lot of, a lot of beekeepers did this. I mean, It had been a common practice from the 50s until, until 2017. And then in 2017, the FDA put in place something called the Veterinary Feed Directive, which I'll talk about here in a second. And all of a sudden, that easy access, that over-the-counter access to um, antibiotics, uh, all, now you need to have a veterinarian's prescription to buy it, you know? I'm sure, I mean, look, if Kentucky's the Wild West in some ways. I am sure, and, and the beekeepers tell me more than I want to know. <laughs> I'll just leave that there. <laughs> but, but I know that there are workarounds, you know. Uh, but, but the diagnostic kit is, in, at least in my state, that's something that a beekeeper can do to get a diagnosis and take action if, if the, the hive has American fowl brood and I am six hours on the other side of the state and I can't get to them. How do right. you do the diagnostic kit? Oh, it's really easy. There are directions on the back of it. It's just like an early pregnancy test kit, you know? <laughs> Every, everybody does this, right? <laughs> to talk and we are laughing. One more time, please. I said, I have some and I would be happy to donate one to the club to let you guys do a demo. And, I mean, you can do it on the healthy hives. Yeah. He has a demo. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to use. You'll get a response in five minutes. So everybody, let's go off the apiary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, the, and the advantage, and you know, for me anyway, I like to have three and uh, three or four you know, yeah, I have a um, I have, I have like if it's a really healthy colony or it's seemingly healthy, you know, a, a second test 
helps me make a difficult decision. It takes the emotion out of it. All right. So I, I like to have several diagnostic kits just for my own. I mean, my husband and I have 130 colonies, you know, so it's, it's helpful to have several. Yes, ma'am? So the question is, is there a database, I'm assuming that you mean here in Florida, that has points where there are outbreaks? And I don't know the answer to that question. What I can tell you, okay, so the answer is no. What I do in Kentucky is I have to, I have to submit a monthly health report where I do talk about, you know, there were three European foul brood outbreaks in the state. You know, or in the month of September, we had a lot of robbing because we were on our fourth week without rain. You know, those kinds of things. So I do provide that monthly health update to the beekeepers uh, in my newsletter, and I also provide that information to the, U uh, to the USDA. So, but I don't know about that here. And I wish that there were. I can tell you this, too. Um, I put out a newsletter for the apiary inspectors of America and we will routinely uh, get that information out to the apiaries. Like, so, so that's how I know, for instance, that Pennsylvania is having an American foul brood outbreak. You know, it's because of this apiary inspector of America newsletter. So, so we stay in touch with each other. Uh, but no, there's no easily uh, found one. And in part, you know, it, to me, the, the, one of the reasons why I want to talk about American foul breed, especially my own experience, is because it's been my experience that, that beekeepers are, are ashamed somehow of having this. And they don't want to, to admit that they've had a hive that's gotten sick. And, and I just think that that holds us back. You know, it makes a bad problem even worse. You know, and so that's kind of one of the reasons why I, um, you know, when Gabriella asked what I wanted to talk about, I thought, well, we need, to, we need to talk about this. Now, I mentioned that this particular disease has two stages. In the previous state, uh, slide, we looked at the disease in the bacterial stage, where you could do a rope test. Uh, this is the scale. Uh, after a while, like I said, if you've gone three weeks and you come back and you see this, then that bacterial stage has moved into the spore stage and it's formed what we call scale, right? If you, if you so happen to have a, uh, like an ultraviolet light in a workshop, if you hold that frame underneath, and mind you, again, you should, be hold it, you, you should have disposable gloves to hold this. Um, that will show up really clearly under ultraviolet light if you happen to have that. But, you know, you saw where my hives were. I was in the, you know, where I was in Jenkins, Kentucky. <laughs> you know, you're doing well to have a light bulb there, you know, much less ultraviolet light. But, you know, some of the, the hives had had scale, you know. Um, and that, so that's another, that's another symptom. But that's the sunken wax capping that I'm talking about here. And another way that this disease spreads uh, is, you know, some, somebody will call you and say, oh, I have a barn full of equipment, beekeeping equipment. My uncle got out of it. You can have it for free. And you're not thinking about the ramifications of that. And so you jump in your truck and you're not wearing gloves and you're, you know, you throw that equipment in the back of your truck. There's no plastic lining in the bottom of it. There's nothing. <laughs> and so that's, that's another common way that it spreads. But especially beeswax, you know, uh, contaminated beeswax. Beeswax is the lungs of the hive. And, so these uh, spores can get in that beeswax and stay dormant. Somebody was talking about Camplotum. These spores can stay dormant for up to 70 years before they are reactivated. And you won't know what triggers that. You know, that's the real heartbreak with American foul brood. And that to me is why we shouldn't take it personally when a hive begins to succumb to American foul brood. You know, there's so many environmental stresses. You won't know what will trigger that. Okay, yes, ma'am. 
Not to humans, no. The question is, does, does American foul breed spores have implications to humans? No. Um, in fact, uh, some beekeepers will even harvest honey before they burn those bees, you know, because the honey is fine. Our digestive systems are fundamentally different than the digestive system of honeybees, right? So, so we're fine. Um, <clears throat> of course, the problem is, is that you don't want to, to, to treat a hive with an antibiotic and then consume that honey. That's a big no-no among beekeepers. For similar reasons why, you know, there are controls for varroa mites, you know, and you don't want to use those controls when honey supers are on. You know, when honey supers are on, there's only like two or three you can use, you know. When you take them off, all of a sudden there's seven or eight. Yes, ma'am? What can you clean your equipment with? I'll get there. The question is, what can you, how can you sterilize your equipment? And I end there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Donna. Um, I think I took European out. Maybe I didn't. I will, I will answer your question this way. So underneath this wax capping, right, that's what healthy larvae should look like. It should be pearly white, right? That's, that's how it should, you know, no issues. But as the bacteria is beginning to um, attack that it, it begins to darken. Uh, it will look like caramel, you know, when you do that uh, test. European foul brood, you can see the discoloration in the open cell. You can see like three, you know, two-day-old, three-day-old larva begin to darken. In some cases, uh, the, the larva will darken so much that you can see the spine. You know, so it's very clear. So you don't have to, you don't have to do a rope test. There's no capping to puncture, you know? It's right there in front of you. So, so that's the biggest difference. It's, European foul brood is just easier to see. European foul brood in Kentucky tends to clear up very quickly with a honey flow. I do not know why. I will get calls about European foul brood in the months leading into May. In the first week of May, black locusts will start blooming, and boom, those calls quit. Those hives recover, they're ready to go again, you know. So in my case, the way that I work with a European foul brood, we happen to have enough colonies that I will simply uh, re-queen the affected colony. You know, if a, if a colony is coming down with European foul brood and it's, it looks like it's maybe a bad case, I'll just, you know, dispatch that queen, let it sit queenless for 48 hours, let the worker bees clean up, let them have a break from the brood cycle, and then obviously take a, one of my emergency nooks and combine that with uh, the effective colony. And the other thing, I don't have that in here either, but in terms of your, um, your first aid kit as a beekeeper, you should always have an emergency nook, a nook that just exists for for cases like European foul brood, chalk brood, sac brood, those brood diseases like that because then you have a, a queen, right, that's right there. You don't have to call, you don't have to order it, you don't have to drive, it's just right there, so. But a lot of times, the queen is perfect. That, it can, he, that, so the, the comment is a lot of times the queen is perfect, you know, that the, that the European foul brood isn't maybe being caused by the queen. And, that, and in that case, you can simply cage her. But if she starts laying again and you have those same issues, you're holding that, in my, in my state, let me say this, there's some differences with my state and your state, right? That I have to have that colony ready for winter by the first week of November. It's a math game. And the longer that that hive doesn't have a productive laying queen, then the, then the harder it is for me to get that hive up to the, you know, that, that 40, 50,000 bees by that first week of November. So for me, it's always a math game, you know? Like how many days is this hive gonna be sick? How many weeks is it gonna take? Um, you know, I've got, I don't want to just let it sit declining for a week or two. 
you know, because that's that's worker bees lost. Well, a couple of angles that the European output can come up in the spring, but mm -hmm. the weather, mm -hmm. it's a lot of humid, mm -hmm. it's basically not enough pollen, and the queen is a lot better than the amount of bees that can take care of the so the, the comment is, is that European foulbrew tends to happen in the spring for all kinds of reasons. And, and that, you know, sometimes that can work against the queen. You know, you can have a healthy, viable queen, but just the environment is working against her. And, that, and that's true. That's true. But, yes, ma'am. Yes, Sierra. Yeah, I, I was kind of going to say what Joseph just said. It was my understanding that European foulbrew um, happens more often have a larger proportion of old bees, less young bees in the colony, to feed the amount of brood that the queen has left. And the honey flow clears it up because all of a sudden you've got all of this fresh food coming in and you can outcompete the bacteria in the gut of those young larvae and basically like feed it through the disease. You can get it through that disease. That's my understanding. I'm, you know, I don't it's know for sure. Of the humidity, how bad the weather is. The, hum the humidity is certainly a factor. And, and as you, I mean, again, my experience as a state apiarist is backing up both of what you say. I mean, it, it does tend to happen more often in the spring. And the, at least what I'm seeing is that, again, you know, you get that spring honey flow and they can get right back on their feet again. Um, to go back to American fabric, does that answer your question? Yes. So, so again, it's about visibility. Um, you can see the damage in the open brood with European foul brood. You cannot see that in American foul brood. But the odors will be there for both of them. If, you're, if you have a finely uh, attuned sense of, of smell, you should, you should also be smelling that too. And for many people, that's their first, you know, that's their first awareness like, uh-oh, I have something going on here. But in my state, goldenrod is the state flower, and that nectar will produce a, a, a very odiferous uh, type of nectar for a few days, you know. Now it will dissipate through the course of the fall, but you know some beekeepers mistakenly think that their hive has American fowl breed because that particular flower is so very pungent, and it's not. We also have Malaluca doing the same. I mean, it's like just healthy. kind of like, uh oh, you know. So you got to jump in and just check it, make sure you just check your brood frames. Again, burning time out of mind has been the quickest and cheapest control for American fowl brood. Um, there is a right way and a wrong way to burn a hive. I've unfortunately done them both. I highly recommend that you um, that you do the right way. Have I I've got my uh, slides out of order? Uh, first of all, check with your fire department. <laughs> There are like, you know, 100 out of 120 counties in Kentucky right now have burn bans in place, and you can make a bad situation worse. Uh, so absolutely check with your fire departments before you do this. Um, but then, you know, one of the things that, I probably have these out of order, what I, I in the ideal situation, when I'm dealing with, a, with American fowl brood, which is never ideal, mind you, but I do kill the bees first during the day so that the equipment can dry through the, through the course of the day. Um, and I kill the bees by just taking a bucket of soapy water and pouring it in at the top. Dr. Potter? Yes? Can I, can I raise a controversial question? Sure. I... Sure. <laughs> it's a disease of the brood. The bees are healthy. Sure. I've heard you can do a shook swarm mm -hmm. and save the bees. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the the not the cyst the, cyst, the, um, the, the spore mm -hmm. is easily destroyed with an open flame. No, I would beg to differ. I mean, if so, and this is Dave Westerfeld. All right, I'm about to quote. This is not. <laughs> I mean, Dave. Dave will say that you have to you have to subject that spore to 212 degrees Fahrenheit for longer than 10 minutes, 
And that is most beyond what most tools beekeepers carry. Wow. Still twelve degrees to just boil. Yeah, well, for ten minutes. But who <laughs> who has that source, like I said, in the middle of the field? You know, no I mean well, I like what you're <laughs> So I would, for 10 minutes, you're going to sit there and... <laughs> there's, no, there's no spore I know that can withstand an open flame for more than 10 seconds. Like I said, I'm quoting your own former <laughs> director of apiary services, so you can take it up with him. But, but, and there are cases, you know, I mean, there are, again, you know, if you happen to catch it early, it, in the bacterial stage and you shake your older workers into n brand new equipment, you know, you have a 50-50 chance of, of, of success, right? But th again, <laughs> I'm in a different environment. I'm working against the clock. I, and, and if you don't succeed, right, in other words, the disease just crops back up again, you know, now I'm out new equipment. I'm out, what, I don't know, price of beeswax, the foundation, the frames, you know, a brand new box, you know, the hours it's taken me to do this, the gas it's taken me to drive back and forth, that all equals much higher than it does just for me to simply burn the, the affected colony and, and get on with it. That's my experience, you know. You can We're do you can do what you need to do, but We're talking about the live in, insect. We are not, you know, you're talking about a sick insect. You're talking about a sick insect with a disease that we currently don't have a cure for. And that is, that is a difference. So dig a pit, a burn barrel will also work, right? Um, but you want to dig that pit and then, uh, you know, start your fire in the pit. You know, what I do is start with the frames and then I put the equipment in. And I do the inner cover. I also do the bottom board. There will be some beekeepers who will just take their torch uh, they'll want to save that. For me, it's not worth it. I've had to burn over 40 colonies. I hate this. <laughs> and others, you know. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's, you know, I, this is not something I enjoy doing. But I also hate watching healthy colonies get sick because somebody hasn't hasn't controlled that disease quickly. So dig a pit, burn, burn your equipment, uh, cover the pit when finished. Like I said, a burn barrel will also work, you know? And, and like I said, don't, don't think that I'm enjoying this. Um, the FDA became very concerned with how many, uh, you know, agricultural industries were using antibiotics. Uh, on a uh, proactive basis, when other, you know, we're using, we were using teramycin. To ask, somebody had asked about the commercial industry, and yeah, uh, especially with nooks, they would use uh, uh, teramycin tended to be the favorite where they would apply it, and that teramycin would simply suppress your symptoms of American fowl brood. It would keep them in a state of suppression, uh, and then what happened in my case, I won't say. It, it happened on somebody else's shift. I was not the state apiarist when this happened. But as you know, there are several different bee supply companies in Kentucky. Well, one year, you know, a huge supply of nooks came from out of state. I'm not saying which one. <laughs> and they got distributed. And we have people who come to Kentucky from Indiana, from Ohio, from Illinois, from all over. And they bought these nugs and took them home. They looked fine in Kentucky, according to the apiarist who was serving the state at that time. Well, like a month later, he starts getting these phone calls from all of these other states and beekeepers within the state. Right? And so that's a, that's a way that um, 
that that American foul brood is spread is through is through nooks, and again, one of the the consequences of our overuse of antibiotics is that in some cases now teramycin won't even work to suppress those symptoms, right? But this disease will always outlast the, the antibiotic. That's what you need to remember, okay? So in 2017, the FDA put in place a system using what they already have, right? Which is a veterinary feed directive. And now beekeepers, if they want, you know, if their hive has been properly diagnosed as having American fowl brood, you know, they can call a vet, the vet can come out, the vet will probably bring a diagnostic kit and charge you. In Kentucky, it's $75 for a field visit in addition to the diagnostic kit and, and then write you that prescription. But, but that's not curing this disease. Yes, sir? And in this state, you can't treat an American fowl brood. You have to, you have to burn it. Now, with European fowl brood, you can obviously exercise this as your as your option. And in European fowl brood, um, teramycin typically still tends to work with that. So, uh, but that's you know we've gone to that. And so as a result, we've had an outbreak in San Diego in 2017. Um, in 2017, how many of you all were at EAS in Delaware? The very first hive that we opened in the apiary had American fowl brood. Right? And those hives have been inspected, right? So, you know, so we're getting these outbreaks now. Uh, at HAS, it was in uh, Bowling Green this year. The, uh, there was, I think NPR did a story of Tennessee. Tennessee had an outbreak the very week of HAS. So, you know, we're, we're starting to get more coverage of this. Um, <clears throat> And to show you how quickly things can change in the beekeeping world, uh, Brigham Young University has been working on a biocontrol for American fowl brood. A phage is a bacteria killer, right? Phages are everywhere. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, and they, they're, they're a virus, right? They act as a virus to the bacteria. So Brigham Young had been isolating phages that could attack American fowl brood bacteria. So just consider this an American fowl brood bacteria. And what this phage does is it kind of, it looks kind of like a, we were talking about a lunar module landing. That's kind of what it looks like. In fact, they will say that too. And it will puncture through this membrane and inject its RNA or DNA. Now remember, this is a virus. It will, it will inject its RNA or DNA into this and begin replicating this, okay? And it will eventually crowd out the, the, the DNA of the American foul brood bacteria, at which point it just collapses. This entire bacteria will just collapse. So there's a couple of nice things about this, which is that first of all, it's not chemical. Secondly, phages are everywhere, so they're, they're relatively cheap, right? Um, there's some other, you know, on the other side of the fence, there's some concerns because you're talking about using a virus in a hive, you know? But for my perspective, you know, I, I really find this to be very attractive. And they were promoting it as uh, the, the company that did this is a company called BroodSafe, and they were promoting it as a food additive. So you would add this to sugar, sugar syrup, or sugar, you know, dry sugar for that matter. There is, and I reached out in 2014 and 2015 when I was burning all of these hives because there were some hives that were not showing symptoms at all, right? I don't know how. I mean, they were, they were surrounded by hives that were, that were just ridden with American fowl brood, and somehow they were not showing symptoms. And I needed to move them. I needed to get them out of there as the state apiarist. Uh, I had a responsibility in that particular case to be, to be able to control them. So I reached out to Brigham Young. Um, they sent me their trial phages at that time. This is how they arrived on dry ice. 
um, there was a sprayer in the back. And we simply added these to sugar water, and I did exactly what you said. You know, these hives that were not showing symptoms, you know, in these affected areas, I shook on to new equipment, you know, after spraying every single thing down. I mean, my, my, my jacket, the, you know, every single thing got sprayed with these phages, right? And I moved them, taking an enormous risk, to uh, my own farm. I have two family farms, and so I moved them to one farm that didn't have any bees on them. And those hives ended up surviving. In fact, we still use that yard. It became the basis for another yard. Um, so there's, there's hope. <clears throat> I bring this because they actually started marketing it this year. There has been a hiccup, as there always is. So apparently the EPA is uncomfortable with some of the regulatory processes that may or may not have been followed. I don't know for sure. Um, but they have, uh, so Brood say the team has, uh, has shut down their website. Right? They have um, solicited, they are soliciting, and this is a bring to this to you as an invitation from this team. They would like to do more field trials with this, that the EPA would feel more comfortable approving this if they had more beekeeping buy-in from around the states. So if you are interested in, in working with this team, there is that invitation uh, to reach out to them. Um, they would welcome it because right now, like I said, you know, beekeepers have very few tools to combat this. Burning is horrible. I, I, I agree with you. Um, teramycin is not a cure. So where does that leave us? Um, you know, yeah, you could shake it, you could shake them into new equipment, but you're still taking a 50% chance that you're not getting rid of this disease. And in your case, it may not be as bad of a problem as it is in my state. But, but it's not, I mean, American, I just mean in terms of the time that it takes is not as much of an issue for you as it is for me. You know, I, I need that time. Um, you may be able to get by without that. So if you would like to help, if you would like to work with BroodSafe, um, please contact Ian Esplin. Um, and like I said, they've taken, they've shut down their website, they've shut down everything. I kind of hold on to this just to make sure that I didn't like make it up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it was there, and ultimately, what they would like to do, it, you can see that this is very feasible. It's very reasonable, right? Um, it will not work on European fowl brood at this point in time, but they're trying to isolate phages that can deal with European fowl brood, but they're trying to deal with American fowl brood first, in part because they think the EPA will be more receptive to it because there is such a need. There isn't anything right now beekeepers can use, so they're really trying to work with that. But that's what they had on their website back in January. So you could see that they're you know, this is a very reasonable control. It's not, uh, and the more hives you have, the, the cheaper it gets. Every six months, it stays shelf stable for six months. If you treat once, then wait six months. Wait six months, yeah. Yep. Sure, sure, yeah. I'm, I don't have a sense of pacing here. But I, I'm, it's Friday night, and I'm sure that there are some folks who are tired. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of that. Yes, Ms. Donna. Uh, if, if I can go back a, a, a little bit, when you were talking about vets having to come out and visit, mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable saying my two vets would never know. No. So, the, so Donna's question, comment, it's a comment, right? Yes. That her, you know, why should she call her vet when she's very confident that her vets don't know anything about this? That's why I advise beekeepers to have diagnostic kits. Uh, you know, that, that's the workaround, right? Because it, in my state, those vets 
Uh, in fact, I made some, some available to the vets. You know, I hosted workshops to get the vets up to speed. We watched these slides. I had them there at the workshop, but only a fraction of the vets attended, right? And, and, and to be quite honest, some of these vets don't want to be in a beehive, you know? And so this is a long-term thing. Uh, I have three hands. Do you want, you first, you president, he pulls presidential rank. So one of the great benefits of being a member of Palm Beach County Beekeepers Association is we just happen to have a vet here who was a beekeeper. Sid, please stand up. Oh, so do I need to give you the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sid. I don't have that much to say, except if you do think you're having a problem with any of these things, give me a call. I can come out and we can figure it out and deal with it appropriately. He's on the website all the time. And how much do you charge a, a farm visit? It would depend on how far away you are and how much time I have to travel. Yeah. So I asked him how much how much he charges for a farm visit, and he says it depends. It depends on how far he has to travel. Yes, sir. Those uh, kits is it like uh, those are like a one-time test? Yeah. And one hive. You can't just use this kit for multiple hives. You've got to have. I mean, it's just a one-time thing. What's the roughly cost? Like I said, about fifteen at the max. Yeah, yeah. But what I wanted to say is, if you think you have American Fowl Brew, don't try and order a kit. Please call your uh, district uh, call Chris. Aviator, He's our guy, and inspector. he will come out and almost immediately, and they'll test it for you. So you can save the 15 bucks. But again, she's right. We should be proactive on this kind of stuff. But yeah. if you think you've got it, don't don't waste your time at all. Call our district inspector, and they'll come out. Again, you must be registered. You have a luxury there that I don't have with 13 apiaries. So you've, your local one is a guess of man named Chris, right? Yeah. Very good. All right, has everyone taken this picture of, of okay. Uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, the question? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, this, this like I said, every beekeeper should have a toolkit with first aid kits. Same thing, yep. Exactly. That should be in your toolkit too when it when it comes back on the market. Yeah. What is the shelf like of that? Of, of, of the kit or the safe? The, the kit. The kit, it depends. Like, you know, I, I guess I restocked last year and at that point I was buying them dated into 2021. Okay. So they will last a couple of years. Yeah, you know, it's right there. You know, I don't, it, I think. I, I've used one once. Um, it was, it, they're very easy to use. Yeah. It's a handy little kit. I, I bought, when I ordered them from Man Lake, I had to make up to $100, so I ordered <laughs> A couple shipping. of those, yeah. So I ordered however many I needed to get to $100. <laughs> And they're sitting on the shelf in my laundry room. I've used one of them. Um, they're very easy to use, and the expiration date, yeah, it was like a couple of years off. Yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't have the, um, you know, brood safe is only good for six months. It's only good on a shelf for six months. So there's a little bit difference there. Yeah. smear like the larva on it, and it comes up like No, no, no. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a stick. There's a stick like a toothpick. And you put it in this vial of liquid, and that, and the, and then you pour that liquid on a on a measuring stick, and it, you know, it'll give you a line. It is you like know. a pregnancy test kit, but you have to mix it in the vial that they supply and shake it. I think yep. there's like a shaking time. And then, and then you use their dropper that they supply you, and you put the two drops. So you're not peeing on the test strip. You're <laughs> yep. the dropper. Just to clarify for folks. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, how is it spread? Contaminated honey, we've talked about that. Contaminated equipment. Used equipment is, is, uh, tends to be a consistent source of this. Um, beekeeping bring, beekeeper brings in nooks. Um, so you always want to have an, a quarantine area where you, if you're, if you're buying nooks, don't just walk them straight into your own apiary. Have this area where you can keep them separate. And then, you know, they, 
a very low risk, but it can happen, according to Jim, too. Um, very, very rarely, but sometimes uh, swarms will, will spread that. And I thought that this was a good time to kind of, I, I don't know if you all know this, but we have caught like 30 or 40 different swarms with this. So I thought I would also kind of teach you this little trick of, you know, we plant these pine branches in, in PVC pipe and put lures on these. Um, and that, that's been very effective. And then it's pretty easy because in our situation, we know that our hives are going to swarm. You know, so you can see our apiary. It's maybe 20 feet away. And, um, and so we put these PVC pipes into the ground and put the, the branch there. And then it's just really easy. This saves this saves us from having to climb ladders and climb trees and get on. T I mean, my husband and I are both over 50 now. You know, we do not need to be doing these things. So this is a way of catching swarms. And we, and we use lures, you know, because we, like I said, we know our hives are going to swarm. And so it's just a matter of it getting a little bit more control over there. Slightly moving away from AFD, but I thought, well, if you know, because there is a risk that sometimes swarms can can spread this, I would sneak that in. This is great. So, are you doing this only around your swarm season, or are you having this? Opportunity? That's correct. Because once, um, you know, primarily April, March, April, and May, um, it's not too hot. You know, the hotter it gets. You know, obviously, and then the bees settle down, and they're not swarming as much, and uh, and they, you know, they just swarms don't like to just go to something in the middle of open sun, which is where this apiary is. So they have a little bit more shade in the early spring. So, so I just thought I'd throw that in. Okay, what do state programs do to monitor? And we have in Kentucky a mobile autoclave that we hire somebody to take around the state. And it takes a full day to get this sucker fired up. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's just a, 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 but you know, what it can do is typically at our B school, we'll have it show up. He'll come down the night before, fire it up. So that by early morning when beekeepers show up with their equipment, you know, he's able to, to, to sterilize it uh, through the course of the day and for free. You know, we don't charge beekeepers for this. Um, so that's, but I have to tell my beekeepers, this is not an ambulance, right? Like, do not think that, you know, you can call this university and say, I have a hive with American fowl brood. Please bring your sterilizing unit down this holler, you know. <laughs> They will ignore you, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's not an ambulance. It is best used as a sterilizing equipment in the off season, you know. Um, and it, obviously it breaks down, so sometimes it's not as reliable as it could be. But that's what, you know, that's what we have. Maine has a much smaller autoclave um, that they can, they can sterilize two to three frames. Uh, they can sterilize gloves. They can sterilize hive tools. They can't sterilize entire uh, supers and hives. Yes, sir, in the back. You know what? I do not know if anyone has put their bee suit in that autoclave. Well, no, no, not, not there, but I'm saying washing it. Washing a Clorox, you know, using a Clorox bleach method, but you know, I've I've been known to to go through three or four jackets. You know, I just don't trust them after I do a burn. I just don't. For forty bucks, <laughs> it's 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 so immaterial uh, that I just I'll I'll change jackets. I just you know, yes. I can't tell you the first thing. <laughs> this is not my job. <laughs> it is. It's definitely steam. Yeah. And it stays, you know, and, and, and the equipment that comes out of there, that wax melts, you know, that paint 
comes off of the woodenware. I mean, it is, you know, you've got another job in front of you once you get it back and sterilized. But for, because, you know, because beekeepers are cheap and they love free equipment, frugal. you know, frugal, yeah. You know, this at least this is a way that they can guarantee that they have sterilized their equipment before they put bees in it. So, um, Maryland, I think, has one of the more unique uh, detection uh, methods. Uh, Sybil has trained two dogs, and um, she uses them when she's doing the commercial beekeeping uh, operations. You know, the dog will go to the ones because they have such a, a stronger smell than, than humans. Um, that's that's right. Indiana, I, I wasn't sure if there were any of your beekeepers who have ties to Indiana. Uh, they have an electron beam process. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to do this, the beekeeper has to pay 500 bucks. You know, 100 hive bodies ready to treat, $5 per hive. And you have to give them a heads up because they have to shut everything else down to get your equipment in there. So it's a little difficult. Um, you've got, it's not impossible. Don Hopkins sent me this picture of the de de decontamination unit. He doesn't remember the last time it was used. <laughs> you know, it's like, he, he, he can't tell you how it works either. He's just like, okay, we have it, it's here. But I, yeah, it's like this. And then, of course, Florida, you have required inspections and you have to burn. The UV. The, 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 this one? It's just a, yeah, it's just like a pressure cooker. See, so it's, 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 yeah, you put your equipment in there. But I don't, yeah, that's your hot water heater right here, right? But like I said, Don doesn't even remember the last time they opened that thing. It's probably rusted shut, you know? So, so I, I'm putting my hope and my effort into phages uh, because like I said, they're, they're non-chemical, they're cheap, they're everywhere. Um, you know, uh, when, when the bacteria dies, it just decomposes right there in the hive, that's it, it goes away. There's no residue in your beeswax. Um, you know, the bacteria can't develop resistance. So the question is, is uh, in terms of a phage, how long does it take? Typically, phages can work pretty quickly. I mean, they're a virus. They, they adhere to that bacteria as you apply them. And then they, they begin to inject. Yeah, or apply it to the hive. It should be. It sh they should work immediately. You say apply it. How would you apply it? Like, like a sugar syrup. Just spray it. You know, just spray them. I I used a spray bottle because I was also spraying equipment. You know, but if your if your hive is healthy anyway, and you're just you know wanting to just make sure that they don't get it, then you can use just dry powdered sugar. You know, like I had, I, I mean, I brought this to show you what they were distributing up until July, just so that you could see I wasn't making it up. <laughs> you know, I mean that you can you, you can just apply this to the hive in its own form. Yes, sir. Just say about uh, four months ago, we pinned Chris down, and he said he's only found one case of foul brood. Oh, that he's been in his excellent! But now that there's no longer prophylactic treatment, we probably should not be as relaxed as we were after we heard that, because the longer we go without uh, treatment of that nature. But I, to follow up on that, the other question I wanted to ask was if a hive has been prophylactically treated, say the nukes, have been treated that way and as you said they got shipped all over the place how long before the suppressed yeah it can be as it can be as little as two weeks later at, at least I'm, and i'm and i'm using the experience of my predecessor for that to be clear um, every hive in florida probably has american foul brew spores Spore. in it yes. I would, I'm not going to make that broad of a generalization, but I will say 
that there are cases of American fowl breed that probably have not been reported. And, I'm, I know, and, and that there are probably hives that have died either because the beekeeper didn't know that it was American fowl brood or didn't want to acknowledge that it was American fowl brood. Have you uh, learned anything so far about this new app that's going to be coming out where literally there's a 99% accuracy apparently if you slide your phone into the hive and put it on listen, the, the sound that a beehive makes when it has American fowl brood is so distinctive so I can't speak to that at all with any authority. Um, I've got my diagnostic kits. I've got my phages. <laughs> I I can tell you this that at least typically by the time I get called to a potential American fowl brood hive, you know it's already in decline. There is. I mean, there's very little sound. There are very few bees. You know what I'm talking about? Is you know, this thing they've been working on. You can go through an entire bee yard. It let you can it takes about 90 seconds per hive. And you just go. And then within five minutes, as it processes back to your laptop, all the hives might look the same, but they'll tell you to go look at that fourth hive again. Just in case. Just in case. Like do it again. Yeah, exactly. If it comes up twice, then they. Bee inspectors weren't catching it, but it was there when they used the test kit. Wow. Hmm. That's new information for me. Okay. All right. Very good. I didn't. I didn't know about that. Yes, sir. As far as uh, say you go into a bee yard, you got a dead out, and no bees in it, pretty much, you know, gone. Is there a way to troubleshoot whether it's American fowl or not? You know, you can send a you can send a frame to the USDA Bee Lab in Beltsville, Maryland, and they will analyze it for you for free. You know, so that's you you want to send a frame from the brood area, um, but and they and they can also, I mean, they can give you some feedback too in terms of you know, that's what I would do. But. Yeah, scale doesn't, it doesn't go away. Yeah, the scale. And it's, you're looking from the top of the frame because the, the scale is on the bottom of the cell. Yeah. And that doesn't go away. The bees don't remove that. You know, after, after the bees, yeah. The scale, it's right here. What more slides, 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 I wouldn't call that scale, but it is, it's, it's the decayed remains of a larva before it becomes scale, right? Um, go back to that, go back to what they were talking about, the other one your sunken cappings. So that people know, go back. Yes. So, so people know where the scale is. In, there's a, a disintegrated um, pupa or right here. free pupa in that one cell on the bottom of the cell. That's where the scale would be. That would eventually dry up into a hard scale on the bottom of that cell. And that's what she's saying is the scale. That's what they call the scale. Yeah. So if you hold the frame, like in the picture of her scale picture, and you're looking at it at the t from the top of the cells, so that you can see the bottoms of all the cells, you can see the You scale. can see it, yeah. It can be chunked with people that don't know what they are looking. Any piece of chunked they will get scared that this is uh, a American life. Do you have chalk brood outbreaks in Florida? Yeah. Big time? Not yeah. Not very often. We have it in Kentucky, uh, on all parts also of the state. In the, in the spring, more. Yeah. 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 
tough road is also not infectious. It's but tough. It's not Kentucky is the one state that, that, that does not have a law prohibiting that. My first month on the job as a state apiarist, uh, a beekeeper called, he, has, he still has hives and logs, right? What we call in my area gums, bee gums, and because of black gum trees uh, hollow out and the bees move in. So I went down to see him, and I obviously I'm just glad that he re, he's communicating with me. You know, it's, I'm, he's so I had him lift up the hives, and then I was underneath with a flashlight and the mirror, you know, poking the mirror up into the hive so I could see that the larva was healthy and I could smell that it wasn't, you know, affected. And you know, it was a. It, but there are still beekeepers in Kentucky that will keep their bees. And he didn't have, the, the, the big issue with your other types of hives is that it's, it's more difficult to catch that. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you do need to be able to look at the brood and in a timely fashion, you know. So um, I'm not against other types of hives, uh, but certainly having them in movable frames, top bar hives, for instance, it's, you know, it helps you uh, help the bees, you know, and so it doesn't get away from you. Yeah? Now, you first, my interest would be for you testing for the place in Maryland you were talking about for the foul group. Do they test honey that way too? The USDA uh, Beltsville Lab? Um, no, it is simply a diagnostic service uh, for health, uh, you know, just for health reasons. Uh, but for honey, I typically send my honey to, to Texas A&M. Uh, where Dr. Vaughn Bryant does it. I will say that uh, the Kentucky has just received a grant. Uh, his student is a woman named uh, Jen O'Keefe. She teaches at Moorhead State University and she is paired up with um, another chemistry professor and we should be able to offer honey analysis in our state pretty soon, like next year, uh, because she she was you know, one of Von Bryant's star students. So we were we lucked out on that one. Yeah. What you see on the left side picture is a, a very big, <coughs> if it's a lot of mites, they yeah. can also present mm -hmm. such a picture. Yeah. And uh, especially the European one. So what he is pointing out is that sometimes when you have a super hygienic bees, um, you know they can detect mites, uh, mite loads in the in the bottoms of the cells too, and so they will go ahead and puncture those cells too. So you can, in some cases, see punctured cells, but if you don't see the the sunken cappings, or if you don't have that really strong cell um, or that smell, that that, that sense of uh, foul brood smell, you know that becomes. You know, you can do a mite sample, for instance, and be able to check if you have high mite counts. You know, that, that's, that's the thing. They're usually not, they're not caramel and ropey and gooey. Either. Yeah. Usually yeah, you don't have a rope test with, with mites. Yeah. They're healthy yeah. underneath, usually. Yeah. Yeah. What is the difference between, actually, the no. check The check Again, that's that's one of those that I just requeen. I don't no, no, even. No, no. If you have sack brood, it's not American fowl brood. Yeah. It's not therapy. Because the the larva is the there's a no, there's a sack like around the. It's like an sack, and it may look like American fowl, but it's not American fowl. No, because it's chunky. You know, it doesn't. You don't have the rope test with with sack brood. Yeah, it's not, it, 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 you don't have the smell either. Yeah. You, you know, well. I mean, there's a couple of different things that distinguish that there. But, all right, well, thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>